Good morning and welcome to Fusion Church where we worship together both here in the sanctuary and from near and far over Zoom. But wherever we are, we are together as the one body of Christ. I invite you now to join me in the call to worship in your bulletin. We know that God is always with us. So we come this morning to remind ourselves that we are with God. In this time of worship, may our hearts be glad. May our souls be glad. God shows us the path of life, and in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. this morning with a moment for mission. Every month we choose a different organization, either locally or nationally, that our church wants to help support their, you know, their work. And this month um, for October, the mission is the Allegheny County Office uh, Senior Foundation, the Allegheny Senior Foundation. And so we've invited Cheryl Zborka, who is the Nutrition Services Coordinator at Allegheny County Office of the Aging, or at least that's what your LinkedIn profile said your official title was. Um, so she's going to come up and talk to us a little bit about the Allegheny Senior Foundation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That was actually my former life. <laughs> I retired in 2016. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you so much for inviting me to speak about the Senior Foundation. I'm so appreciative of your 
uh, generosity and willingness to support our efforts. Um, it's, it's so needed. Um, the Senior Foundation is really just a board of volunteers um, that have goals to uh, promote programs and develop resources to support the older Americans of Allegheny County. Um, because we're all volunteers, and I'm currently the treasurer, so I can speak knowledgeably about this, um, almost all the fund, I think a very high percentage, like 99% of all monies brought in or collected go directly to provide services to enhance the lives of older Americans, older Americans, yeah, older uh, adults in Allegheny County. Um, we have very few expenses. There are no paid salaries. There's no physical building or anything like that. Um, so the only expenses we have maybe are to pay the accountant to do our taxes, maybe some stamps, and you know. And if we do fundraising, you know, maybe some advertising and things like that. So we have very very, very low overhead, which is a definite advantage. Um, <clears throat> what programs do we support? Um, uh, the two major ones are personal emergency response systems. So that's a, a, a um, you know, if you're in your home um, and, you know, it's the uh, I fall and I can't get up system, <laughs> we're all familiar with, personal emergency response systems, and the Meals on Wheels program. Um, and in my former life as a nutrition service coordinator for the Office for the Aging, I was um, responsible for the Meals on Wheels program and the Congregate Meal program. And I know from that experience that although we had um, grant monies from state and federal government and the county, um, usually those grant monies are stayed level uh, while increased expenses and increased need. Um, and so in 2003, um, the Senior Foundation was established so that there would be a, a way to try to meet those unmet needs, um, that shortfall in funding. Um, and the, the not-for-profit foundation is able to apply for grants like United Way grants and the um, Alfred Station Community Chess monies, um, and also we can fundraise. So um, we've been busy doing that since 2003. Since 2003, almost a half a million dollars has been um, obtained and used to support programs throughout Allegheny County. That's a lot of money. Um, in, um, since 2003 through the end of 2020, um, 250,000 of that, or close to that, um, has been used for the personal emergency response systems. And there's a monthly fee for those personal emergency response systems. So for people who might find that a financial burden, um, those monies are used to help offset the expense for people. And um, around 140000 has been used for Meals on Wheels. So um, it, it's been be very beneficial for the Office for the Aging. Um, as a board member, we have kind of two tasks then. One, a major one, is to fundraise. Um, that would be my least favorite thing in the world to do uh, ever, <laughs> but um, it, we need be we need people to help with that. Um, what we've done in the past, we've had uh, dinner, dance, basket auction events. Um, in 2019, we had a wine tasting um, in Cuba at the Cuba Cultural Center. And what board members' responsibilities then were uh, to, um, to get restaurants to, uh, you know, ask restaurants to provide a tasting. So they provided food for that. And so board members went out and got the food and set up and, um, uh, you know, manned the event. Um, we also had sponsors, asked for sponsors and donations. I think we raised um, around $10,000 for that event. 
Um, in 2020, we did nothing. We, like you all probably, we were sitting home communicating via Zoom. Um, uh, this last year, we, we tied into the National Meals on Wheels, uh, March for Meals uh, um, fundraiser, and we had two local grocery stores do a checkout donation for us, um, and we did a mail out to all our former donors um, and asked for contributions. I think we had Facebook. I think we raised around $9,000. Um, and so that was what we did this past year. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what will, well, depends on what COVID does. <laughs> We're hoping to have an in-person event uh, next year. The other half of our responsibility is, is to really um, look at what we can do to meet the needs of older adults in Allegheny County. What would enhance their lives? And so one of the things we're doing right now um, is uh, partnering with Ardent Solutions, who is looking at an AAR program called Aging, um, Age Friendly, I have to look at it. What is it? Age Friendly Networking. It's a, it's a program that's uh, sponsored by AARP and has been developed in lots of communities across the country. Um, and what they what they are doing, they you might have gotten a survey in the if you get the uh, uh, the newsletter from the Office for the Aging, there was a survey in there asking for your opinions. What would best meet your needs, and what would you need to have in your community to help you be successful as you get older? What would you enjoy? What would help you? Um, and also, they have been having community uh, meetings. Now, there was one at the Alfred Station uh, Seventh-day Baptist Church. I'm not sure the date. I don't know if any of you attended. But they were looking for input from the community. Um, so they've been hosting those in most of the communities across the county, um, hoping to figure out what people think would best help them. Um, I did fill out the survey, um, and in my mind, I live on a two-story home in rural Arkport on a 100-acre farm. My husband is five and a half years older than me. Um, I always had this rule of thumb when I delivered meals. If I, if, well, sometimes I got called into delivering meals. Um, on, you know, and I did, maybe didn't know exactly which home it was. If if I was delivering to a person that needed meals and I wasn't sure which home it was, I usually went to the one that was least maintained. And that's sad, right? <laughs> um, and if they're you know, not able to prepare meals, they're probably not able to maintain their home either, right? Um, so my husband and I have a deal. I do the landscaping. I do the inside house stuff. He does the lawn mowing. <laughs> right? Um, one time I drove a lawnmower into a pond. So, I mean, no. <laughs> I do not want to do that. Um, so, if something happened to him, who would mow the lawn? Right? Who would clean the trees out of the gutters? And he's 77 and a half, so I don't want him up there cleaning the trees out of the gutter either. Um, you know, so uh, those kinds of things. We had these white-faced hornets in our hedges this, this summer. And even the bee guy was afraid of them. You know, who do we call uh, to take care of that? So, so one community in Maine who has developed this age-friendly um, uh, communities has developed a resource manual for each community of resources. We talked about that. We thought, oh man, there's such liability to have a list of people you could call and what if you had somebody on there that took advantage of people or whatever. We need people in each community who know people to develop a, um, a resource manual, a list of resources and keep it updated. So we're looking at something like that um, and um, 
the Office for the Aging right now is in, busy hiring home health aides because, you know, Medicare doesn't pay to have somebody come in and clean your home if you need help with that or get or shop for you or whatever. So um, we're hoping to support that. Um, you know, other things that come to mind, you know, we might want to go up to Buffalo, for instance, and see a, a, a show up at Shea's, but do we want to drive up to Buffalo and come back at night from Buffalo? Uh, maybe a bus trip up to Buffalo to see a musical or something um, would enhance people's lives so you didn't have to drive. I don't want to drive back from Buffalo <laughs> at night. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're thinking about looking at. If you have ideas um, and maybe you weren't able to attend that community uh, interest meeting that they had, um, you're certainly welcome to uh, offer your ideas but so we welcome your financial support certainly always we're looking for board members if you think that you could if the meetings are once a month um, if we have a fundraiser going on there might be a little more effort into it but if you if you have good ideas and you would be a good community um, person here in Alfred we don't have anybody from Alfred on the board right now um, you know, what comes to mind to me in Alfred is that we have a lot of resources in Alfred. We have maybe student service organizations um, from the two colleges. Um, but, you know, if you needed help raking your leaves, would you know that you could call them and say, hey, could I have a few students to help me rake leaves? You know, is there a number that you could call? Uh, could that be on the resources um, list? So um, I'm going to put, um, I think, I'm trying to think how, I'm going to leave, I'm <laughs> sorry, but because um, I'm going to my church service, but um, I'm trying to think, what, you know, maybe I can give Mary Lou my number. And if you have ideas or if you'd like to be on the board, um, I would so welcome that. We would so welcome it. Sometimes we have trouble getting a quorum to make a vote on the board, right? Um, <laughs> so we, we do need new members. Um, and we all have retired people, so we're all busy visiting grandchildren and out of town and whatever. Um, so we would welcome board members and your support. So thank you very much um, for inviting me and, and thinking of us and supporting us. So as always, if you would like to donate, make a check out to the church and write um, the Allegheny County um, <laughs> Senior Foundation, thank you, on it. Um, at this time, I would like to invite Noah Napolitano to do our reading. Say hi first, Noah, so I can get you pinned here. here he hi. Is. Hi, this is Noah. Where are you right now? Um, I'm in my dorm room in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh at Chase? Is that the name? What's the name Chatham. of the... What is it? Chatham. Chatham. I got to see. That was close. Okay. Chatham. So welcome. Glad you were able to come today and read our, do our reading for Dexter time. Go ahead. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy it. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Thank you very much. Study hard. So today, well, for the last week and for the next few weeks, postseason, baseball, right? So we're all thinking baseball, aren't we? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, some of us, some of us are thinking baseball. Some are still thinking football, like my son. But um, some of us are thinking baseball. I'm a big baseball fan. And in fact, what did? Hold on. Yes. I not only watch baseball. I score baseball. So get a close up of that, John. This not only do I score baseball, but I keep all my scorecards. That's really, really nerdy. So this is when you score a baseball uh, game. This is a Toronto Blue Jays game. And what you have to do is each single up to bat, you write what the batter did at that at bat, whether the batter made an out, whether he made like here, he got all the way to third base. Here are their couple home runs. And so you can then at the end of the game, you can look across at each batter. So uh, Melky Cabrera, he got a, a, a hit, he got an out, he got a strikeout, and he got a ground out. So four times up to bat, he got one hit. So he was batting 250, right? So you know for that game, he was batting 250. That's, that's mediocre. That's not a great baseball uh, stat. But in baseball, the players at the end of every game, they know exactly how well they did or how badly they did. And at the end of the year, every single at bat is calculated. And so everything that they did that year is not only kept, not only do people keep records of it, but they publish it like in the paper and online. Now, how would you feel if everything you did in your life were scored and then published for the world to see? So I was thinking about that and I was thinking, okay, what would I do if I scored my dogs? Now I have two dogs. One of them, you know, is Dexter. And one of them is Cody, who's not so great at being uh, in, in church. So we have a stand-in pinch hitter. This is, this is Cody, the pinch hitter. Okay, so let's see how they each do at various things. So the first thing that they're going to do when they come up the bat here, is I'm going to put some food down and I'm going to tell them to wait. So let's see, sit, 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 thank you. Wait, wait. Okay, that's a hit, wouldn't you say? Give him a hit for that. How about Cody? Cody, here's Cody, here's some food, wait. <laughs> How did he do? Out, he got an out. Cody, no, he got an out. Okay, now here's a little napkin. Sit, sit again. What are you gonna do with that napkin? Did he bother the napkin at all? Did he leave it alone like all good dogs should leave napkins alone? What do you think, hit or an out? Yeah. Hit, he got a hit. Here's Cody and a napkin. I don't even have the napkin on the floor. I have the napkin neatly in my lap. Here's Cody. Rip, rip, shred, shred, shred. He's better at shredding him than I am. There we go. That's, that's real life. Okay, how did he do? Hit or an out? Out. Okay, now I'm going to ask them to come and snuggle on my lap. Dexter, come and snuggle on my lap. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he's looking for the trees. <laughs> Snuggle on my lap. How's he doing? Out. Sorry, you got an out. He's not a big lap snuggler. He likes to snuggle, but not on the lap. Here's Cody on my lap. He's a really good lap snuggler. So what's he get? A hit. Okay, so is anybody keeping track? How many outs? How many hits? How many outs? How many hits? Okay, so we're up to the last inning. So here we go. Dexter, sit. Okay, look at all those strangers out there. What are you going to do about it? He's just going to be a good dog, right? So is he being obnoxious? Is he being, uh, is he treating strangers badly? He's getting a hit. He gets a hit. Here's Cody for real which is why he's not here. Strangers! Okay, 
Yeah, you tell him. You tell him be quiet. That's for real. What's he get? Out. Okay, so what's the score? How many hits? Three. How many hits? Okay, who do I love more? Clearly, I look at the score. Three hits. One hit. Who am I going to love the most? What does Paul say? Did anyone listen to what Noah was reading? In the scripture, it says, love keeps no score. Love does not keep score. So what Paul was saying is that God doesn't keep score. Thank goodness. God's not keeping a record on you and checking off every time you do something wrong and every time you do something right and adding it up at the end to decide how much God loves you. And we shouldn't keep score of one another either. We shouldn't write down every wrong against us and every right against us to determine how much we love. Love does not keep score. So thank goodness, Cody, love does not keep score. I do love you. You drive me crazy, but I love you very much. <laughs> we, won't go to, we won't go to Dexter. Shall we say a prayer? God, we thank you that love does not keep score, that you love us even when we do the things that we know we shouldn't do. Help us to keep trying to be better people, but help us to also have confidence that you will forgive us and that you will take us back into your embrace no matter how many mistakes we make and help us do the same for others. Hear us now as we together say the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I look to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. In addition to the mission of the month, I do have a few other announcements. Um, we ask you again, if you are over at the Church Center at any point, either during coffee hour today or if you can come in during the week, uh, add your name to the list of UUC members. This is something that the Centennial Committee is doing. They would like everyone to sign their name on a sheet of paper. Anyone who has been at UUC for more than 25 years are asked to place a colored star next to their name. So um, if you could do that, if you cannot get down to the church center, if you're out of town, any, uh, but would still like to have your name recorded there, you can always send your signature to the church and Lana will affix it um, by printing it off. Uh, we are happy to uh, be having coffee hour again, but we still need some coffee hour hosts. I don't know where we are, Sharon, and signups. Do we still need people for November and December? Okay, definitely need them. So please contact Sharon Burdick if you're helping, if you can help out. And at the moment, I believe we're just doing beverages still. We are, okay, okay, so m we're mostly emphasizing beverages. <laughs> my camera, my webcam just fell on. Well, won't be able to, we won't be able to see uh, Laurel. My camera just fell off. <laughs> So anyway, um, also we could use a vacuum cleaner. The uh, church uh, would like to have a good quality vacuum cleaner for the church. So if you have one that you don't need and would like to donate it, please let the trustees know. Um, next Saturday, I should know this, what time is the dinner? Five? <laughs> I'll be there, I promise, I'll be there. Uh, there is going to be a celebration of my ministry next uh, Saturday at the Lake Lodge. If, um, if you have not signed up for the dinner, I think it's probably too late for the dinner, but we can certainly invite you to come. Uh, is the program, do you know what time the program is going to be? Is it after dinner, before dinner? 6.45. 6.45 is the program, so. Oh, okay, and you're gonna be Zooming the program as well with this link. Okay, so if you're not able to make it to the dinner and want to come at 6.45 to see the program, um, you can do that, or you can use this church link to watch the Zoom program. So that's next Saturday. Um, are there other announcements? Any other announcements that anyone has? Yeah, when um, the lady was talking about the Senior Foundation, I thought I'd let you know that one of the charities that the Community Chest supports is the Senior Foundation, and the Community Chest will be starting its campaign in the first week of November. So I just thought you would like to know that, that that's 
a good charity that we support as the community test for Alfred at Alfred Station. And there are many other charities. I think there are 15 charities that we're going to be supporting this year. Uh, so you can look, look for that when the time comes. Okay, thank you. Are there other announcements? Is there anybody in, out there in Zoom land? If you do have an announcement, just raise your hand. Jan? Okay. Okay, so for those who are concerned about the dinner, um, it will be family seating, so social grouping to keep us uh, safe during the dinner part. And the rest of the time, if you're not eating, we are asking people to mask. So hopefully there will be no outbreaks of COVID from, from this celebration. Are there any other announcements or anything that you'd like to share? Catherine, go ahead. I just wanted to say that the mask uh, requirement is a SUNY requirement. We, we don't have a choice on that. So please do bring your mask. We'll try to have some there at the check-in table as well. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? At this time then, I will pause the recording. And I invite you to bow your heads in prayer with me. God, you made us in your image. You taught us about your love through your son, Jesus Christ. And through him, we know that you keep no record of our wrongs. You forgive, you have mercy, and you believe that we can do better tomorrow. We ask that you look on compassion, look with compassion on all of us, that you take away the arrogance and the spite that too often infects our hearts, that you break down walls that we have put between us and others and unite us instead in bonds of love. Help us to work through our struggle and our confusion so that we may accomplish your purposes on earth and guide us with your wisdom and your strength. We pray today for those who suffer injustice, especially remembering Ding Jiashi and his family. And may all who are unjustly accused or imprisoned be freed to live in wholeness and safety. May we have the will and the courage to speak out on their behalf and seek justice and freedom for them. We pray for those who are ill, that they may know your healing touch especially Michelle Garcia Escobar, Clayton Stutzman, Hugh Longelier, Lois Stiles, Wes Bentz, Lowen, Marnie Johnson, Stephen Lukey, Tirsa Watson's family, Angie Ninos, David Dubois, Ray Chambers, Nolan Tormey, the Juicianic family, and Ryan, Beverly's son-in-law. And we pray as we do every week that we may have patience with one another in these stressful times that we may look for opportunities to create beauty and spread joy and hope, that we may work for the common good, be steadfast in love, work steadfastly in faith, and always cultivate peace. Accept these prayers as a sign of our desire to be at one with you and at one with each other, living out our lives in peace and compassion as Christ has called us to live. In his name we pray. Amen. Jesus called us to be workers in God's field, sowing generosity, healing, and peace to bring a great harvest of mercy and love. May we consider what gifts of resources, time, and commitment we might make so that the ministry of this church will be a growing, vibrant witness to God's love.
Let's pray together. God of light and beauty, every gift is from you. Even our ability to give is a blessing of your love. We offer you what we have and what we are. Use our gifts to give birth to the world of righteousness where none are in need and we're all draw, we're all draw close to your grace. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now I invite you to join me in the responsive reading taken from 2 Corinthians 5. We walk by faith. We are not attempting to command ourselves commend ourselves to you once again. In that way, you will have an answer for those who boast of what is seen. If we are beside ourselves, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right minds, the love of Christ overwhelms us whenever we reflect on this, that if one person has died for all, the reason Christ died for all was so that the living should live no longer for themselves, but for Christ. And so from now on, we don't look at anyone in terms of mere human judgment, even if we did once regard Christ in these terms. And for anyone who is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old order has passed away.
have been preaching this fall through the historical periods of the Hebrew scriptures, talking about the faith lessons the Bible wants us to learn from all of those periods. And we are going to turn now to the Christian scriptures in the New Testament. Now, while the Hebrew scriptures form two thirds of our Bible and cover a period of about 2000 years, the New Testament, the last one third of our Bible, covers only about 100 years of history. And the earliest of those writings in the New Testament are the letters of the Apostle Paul, written to the first Christian, the first Christian congregations around 25 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Now this can be a little confusing to people because even though Jesus historically came before Paul, Jesus didn't actually write anything down, nor did his immediate circle. There are some letters in our New Testament that are attributed to the disciples, but scholars, use it, <laughs> scholars using textual historical translation, translation analysis believe that those letters were most likely written later by someone else's hands. It was very acceptable in the first century to use the name of a well-respected figure as an indication that what you were writing was in that school of thought or in that tradition. So four decades passed before Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John began writing their gospels. And until they wrote those stories and teachings of Jesus's life, everything that the church knew about Jesus had been passed on orally by his followers. And in fact, you see this in Paul's letter to the Corinthians in a passage that we repeat every single month. He says to the Corinthians, I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That was an oral tradition that he had passed on to the church, and he was reminding them of that oral tradition in his letter. So Paul's letters are the first written documents we have of the life and belief among the earliest Christians. Paul wrote those letters to churches that he had visited in his travels, many of which he had actually helped to start. And he often writes in response to theological questions that the congregations had or problems that have come up in the church since he left. In Paul's letters then, we really get a very first and early look at how Jesus' death and resurrection affected people's understanding of God, their understanding of the world, and their understanding of their own faith. You know, we're so steeped in the gospel tradition that it's hard for us to imagine what it was like to hear about Jesus for the very first time. What it was like to try to understand how his life and his teachings, his crucifixion, as a criminal, and then the report that God had raised him to new life, how all of that fundamentally changed the way you thought about your faith. And reading Paul makes it very clear that not everyone agreed on what that change was or what it should be. So I'm going to read to you first from the book of Acts, which describes the work of the early church, and then I'm going to read to you Paul's own letter which was actually written before Acts, to the churches of Galatia in which he himself describes the work he was doing. Acts 11, 19 through 26. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, the Greeks also, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them and a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When Barnabas came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotion for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went, went to Tarsus to look for Saul, Paul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so it was for an entire year that they met with the church and taught a great many people, 
and it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Now that happy story is now told by Paul in his letter to the Galatians. When they, they the Christians, saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been trusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, Peter, and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave me to Barnabas, and they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, and agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor, which we were actually eager, eager to do. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy until even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Not quite as peaceful of a situation as Acts likes us to think. This past week, the borders between Canada and the US were finally fully reopened for the vaccinated. And I was elated to hear this because my favorite travel destination is Toronto. It's close enough for a quick overnight, but it's eclectic enough that when you walk its streets, you feel like you are far from Western New York. And over the years, I have become quite a canada -file, immersing myself in Anne of Green Gables, CBC programming, and the Toronto Blue Jays. I can even sing all of the words of the Canadian national anthem. And when I go to Canada, I do my best to act as Canadian as I can, trying to blend in with the natives. It's not that I dislike being an American, but I like to see how much of my cultural costume I can shed when I'm in a foreign country. You know, anyone who has traveled to a place where there are a lot of international tourists knows how easy it is to pick out the residents of other countries. Germans usually wear really good footwear, hiking boots, sensible travel clothes. Japanese juggle three different cameras. And Americans, they're the ones dressed in jeans and Nikes, and the men sport baseball caps. Americans are also the only ones who don't bargain in the market but pay the first price quoted, and they are the first ones in line waiting for the restaurant doors to open. If I go to dinner in Wellsville, the restaurant fills up at 5.30. But if I go to dinner in Toronto before 6.30 or 7, it's just going to be me and other tourists from the States. So when I'm in Canada, I try to conform to Canadian customs and dress, leaving my sneakers at home and confidently handing over $2 coins as if my dollars jangle in my pocket every day. The last time I visited Toronto, pre-pandemic, I was walking down Front Street with a confident sort of Canadian air, and as I passed the CBC offices, a street reporter stopped me, and he said, we're doing a documentary on Canada. And I was wondering if you could answer a few questions about Americans' attitudes toward Canadians. I graciously agreed, I waxed eloquent about my love of Canada, but during the entire interview, I was thinking in the back of my head, how did he know I was from the States? What gave me away? What's that a boot, eh? It's just not easy to shed all of the cultural accumulations of your geography. The geographical regions in which we were raised leave their fingerprints all over us, and not just in our choice of clothing. The geography of your childhood has affected the syntax of your language, your feelings about the weather, your taste buds, your manners, and your expectations of what is proper and what is not. 
And moreover, there's an emotional and psychological geography that we carry with us as well that affects us in much deeper ways, that shapes our moral expectations of others, our racial judgments and identity, our openness or conversely our discomfort with people different from ourselves. When we travel to new places and meet new people, we often find that what we assumed is a universally held way of being is in fact particular to our little piece of earth. Now such discoveries should humble us and they should change us. But in fact, I know, and I'm sure you know, many people who travel but come back unchanged by what they've seen. They may have a lot of photos and funny stories about tour guides and a suitcase full of souvenirs, but there's no deeper understanding of all of the ways that they saw in which people can experience life. Instead, other cultures are to them just interesting curiosities with the unspoken assumption that their own way of life is still the best way. When I was a teenager, my grandfather, who had been widowed several years before, remarried, and he chose a woman who turned out to be very provincial in her outlook. Once when they returned from a trip to Paris, we asked her what she thought of France, and she said, and I quote, I hated it. The French are just so rude. No one there spoke English. I believe there are two ways to travel. The most common way to travel is to take a trip in which you change your geography momentarily and you return home with photos of nifty buildings and beautiful landscapes, but you yourself are no different from when you left. The other way to travel is to take a journey, not a trip, but a journey. And when you take a journey, you journey not only with open eyes, but with an open heart, allowing the experience to deepen you and change you. Trips leave you with souvenirs, but a journey leaves you a different person. What journeys have you made in your life? Maybe you traveled somewhere that made you rethink all of your assumptions about what can make a person happy. Maybe you spent time among people who were really different from yourself and it opened your eyes to your own limitations and your own prejudices. Maybe your journey wasn't even a physical one. Maybe it was a journey of the heart in which you traveled an arduous path from one way of believing to a new way of believing and thinking. From condemnation of homosexuality to acceptance of a gay family member from the hurt of past wounds to forgiveness, from a faith of hell, fire, and brimstone to a faith grounded in grace. Maybe you took a journey like that of Paul's who said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, and I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. Trips leave us with souvenirs. Journeys make us into new people. And in our scripture lesson for today, Barnabas took a trip to Antioch. But Paul took a journey. Christian tradition credits Paul with initiating a mission to the Gentiles, but the Bible suggests that the Gentiles were already converting to Christianity before Paul arrived on the scene. When the apostles first began spreading the gospel, they initially took their proclamation to their fellow Jews in the synagogues, where they preached of the arrival of the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus, Christos, God's anointed one. It's really doubtful that any of Jesus' disciples intended to start a new religion. They really believed that the Jewish covenant had been fulfilled in Jesus, and so this good news that they were preaching 
was news for the Jews. When they sent preachers out to carry the word beyond Jerusalem, the apostles initially targeted the cities where they knew there were Jewish settlements, where they hoped that people, fellow Jews, would welcome them and listen to what they had to say. But then, the book of Acts says, a few creative people in Antioch said to themselves, you know, if this is such good news, maybe we should be telling anyone who wants to listen and not just be sitting in the synagogues. These entrepreneurs of the faith went out to the marketplaces of Antioch and they said to the Gentiles walking by, hey, hey, let me tell you about this man named Jesus. And to everyone's surprise, the Gentiles listened. And more than that, many of them decided they wanted to join up. They wanted to follow this Jesus as well and make a commitment to the gospel that they were hearing. And you would think this would be a great thing. The apostles thought so first, at first as well. They hurried Barnabas off to Antioch to supervise this new and unique ministry to the Gentiles. And Barnabas, overwhelmed by the magnitude of the reception that he was getting, recruited Paul to come help him out. It was not long, however, before everyone began to realize that this huge influx of new Gentile members brought with it a huge number of problems, or actually one problem that was huge in size. And the problem was that the Gentile culture was vastly different from the Jewish culture. The apostles insisted that any Gentile convert first adopt all of the Jewish ways and the Jewish laws before they committed to Christ. Our way is the only way. And it was quickly evident that this attitude didn't sit easily with Gentile prospects. Not only were they reluctant to give up their pork, but it also meant that the men would have to be circumcised before they were baptized. Adult men would have to be circumcised before they were baptized. And that was a pretty high bar for recruitment. Paul, however, understood that they were not just on a faith trip, they were on a faith journey. And so when Paul got to Antioch, he let go of his assumptions about what it meant to live a, goodly life, a godly life, and he tried to work out how Christ could fit into this new culture in, way, in ways that made sense to the Gentiles without losing the heart of the gospel. It wasn't easy for Paul to make this change, and we see him struggle with it throughout his letters. But Paul allowed the experiences of the Gentiles to enter his heart and trouble his mind, and he was willing to face the difficult questions that their conversion raised for him, and was willing to do the work it would require to sort out how much of the gospel that he was preaching was really about Christ, and how much was just about himself and what he was used to. It's hard to admit that our assumptions about what is right and what is proper for our faith may actually be more culturally conditioned than Christ conditioned. It's hard to finally and absolutely put our trust only in the power of Christ and not in the power of our practices, our customs, our own personal biases. It's especially hard when you, like Paul or Barnabas, are going to another country with the avowed intent to bring a word to save them and then admit that maybe those people have something that will save you. But that's what it is to make a journey. To journey in faith is to open yourself to seeing the world through the eyes of another so that you yourself will become a new person. And a life of faith is all journey. It's not a trip. If we live our, life, our lives as Christ calls us to live them, then at the end of our lives, we will certainly be different people than we were when we began. Our hearts will be larger our spirits will be deeper than they ever were when we were children. 
we will grow more and more humble and more and more accepting, less quick to judge and more quick to forgive than we were even yesterday. Though few of us will start new churches as Paul did, all of us will encounter people who think differently than we were taught to think and ways of living that make us uncomfortable, new customs, new ideas, new ways of understanding God and one another. And if we're serious about our faith, if we are serious about Christ's call to us, then we, like Paul, will treat this as a lifelong journey of discovery in which we learn more about ourselves, more about others, and more about the very nature of God than we ever thought was possible. Where has your faith journey taken you so far? And where is it going to take you tomorrow? For anyone who is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old order has passed away and everything is new. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God, you have called us to a life of faith. Help us understand that this is a journey we are on, a journey of discovery, a journey in which we will learn more and more about ourselves, about you and about others, if we maintain an open heart, an open mind, and always keep our hands and our eyes open to those around us. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
And now deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the singing brook to you, deep peace of gentle hearts to you, deep peace of the light of the world to you. Go in peace now and forever. Amen. In this church, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In this church, Lord, be glorified today. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified wanting to do that. Those who are on Zoom are invited to stay if they would like for virtual coffee hour. I am going to unmute you all. So everybody on Zoom should be able to unmute themselves if you want to. And for the rest of you, you can't see me because I've got the camera turned around. Bye-bye. <laughs>